This is Dr. Paul Conant, and um, we are very, very, very lucky, fortunate, all those good words, to have him talk with us because the country is being deprived of his wisdom. Dr. Conant, please. Thank you, John and, and, and Kathy, for organizing this, and thank you, Tony and Lisa from the Awareness Party. I've agreed to be an advisor to this party. I think it's very important that we get some ethics back into politics and into science, of course. Um, it's rather dangerous for me to talk in this, uh, with this venue, uh, sponsored here by Uncensored, um, because the other side is on the ropes as far as the science is concerned. They cannot demonstrate that fluoridation is effective and they cannot demonstrate that fluoridation is safe. So they're looking for a diversion. They're looking for a distraction, a diversionary tactic. And one of the tactics that they've used very successfully in the past is to paint opponents of fluoridation as loony tunes, uh, conspiracy theorists. So by being here today, they will certainly use this as against me, okay? But my attitude to this afternoon is that the people here, by and large, I suspect, are people that will look at the evidence, look at the scientific evidence, look at the evidence, and take that, let that evidence take them wherever it may, whether it's about 9-11, whether you believe that a passport managed to jump out of a hostage's pocket, escape a fireball that melted a building and managed to land in the rubble uh, of the 9-11. I mean, we need to pursue questions like that. Obviously, the American media can't pursue questions like that because they're frightened of where it takes them. And this fluoridation debate, as early as the 50s, people were saying, it's beyond debate. They were, they were in the, in the 50s, they were saying, spokespersons for the, the government were saying this is beyond debate. Um, now that's quite a shocker for a scientist because no scientific issue is ever beyond debate. You've always got to entertain the possibility that an inconvenient truth or an unwanted fact is going to destroy a beautiful theory. All of science is a, is a theory and you always have to nurture the notion that some point that theory is going to be overturned. Einstein thought there was only one law that would not ever be challenged, and that was the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, a little bit more about my background. I didn't want this issue. I was approached three times in the, in the 80s, early 90s, to take on this issue by somebody in Ontario, by somebody in Spokane, Washington, and somebody in Ohio. And I turned them down, and the reason I turned them down was two reasons. One, I was incredibly busy. I, teach, I was teaching chemistry full-time at a university, and in my spare time, that was every weekend, term breaks and holidays, I was traveling around the world on waste management, fighting incinerators. And uh, to give you the, the end of that long story, after 25 years, that's taken me to 49 states in the United States, seven provinces in Canada, and 54 other countries. This is actually the fourth time, fifth time I've been to, to New Zealand. So very, very busy, and I didn't want a third issue, and I didn't want a third issue that was going to stigmatize me, which was going to convince people that I was over the edge. They already thought I was on the edge with dioxin and incineration being bad ideas, but this would have definitely pushed them, pushed me over the edge in their eyes. And then my wife, one afternoon, brought a cup of tea and put it on my desk and gave me a bunch of papers and said, dear, would you read these? And I said, what is it? And she said, fluoridation. I said, take that away. These people are crazy. But being my wife, <laughs> unlike those other three people, I couldn't put her off. She says, you've got to read it. I said, look, why? She says, well, there's going to be a meeting tonight in the village, village council, and they're going to consider whether we're going to continue fluoridation. And I didn't even know we were fluoridated, she said. And I want you to tell me whether I should be supporting the continuation of this or whether I should be stopping it. Because she's pretty, you know, involved politically, locally. So, okay, all right, I'll read it. 
Now, when I started reading those papers, the, the one intention I had in the back of my mind was as quickly as possible to persuade my wife that the people opposed to fluoridation were indeed Looney Tunes and we could get on with our life. And one of the things I thought they confused was fluoride and fluorine. Fluorine is the most aggressive, most reactive element in the periodic table, whereas fluoride as a chemical species is very unreactive, unreactive. This is like comparing salt with chlorine. You know, that's the difference. Anyway, I, I read down there and it's clear they hadn't made that mistake. And it turned out that fluoride is extremely active from a biological point of view. And that the first opponents of fluoridation in the United States were biochemists. Biochemists who would use fluoride to poison the enzymes in their experiments. So they weren't Looney Tunes. And there was another thing that struck me how incredibly low the level of fluoride was in mother's milk. In fact, very, very low, 0 0.004 parts per million. And what that means, if you're living in a community where the water is fluoridated one part per million, a bottle-fed baby is getting 250, 250 times the level of a breastfed baby. 25,000 percent higher than a breastfed baby. Now think for a moment what baby's milk is. It's what mother nature has developed over millions of years of evolution to be the best meal for a mammal and for a human. And you, as a, as a uh, specialist in biochemistry, that's my main chemical background is biochemistry, you're ex incredibly impressed with nature's chemistry. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, for us to pull off the chemistry that goes on at room temperature and at atmospheric pressure every microsecond, maintaining all the 10,000 chemical reactions in a human body at the same temperature, we can tell that someone's sick if they just deviate by half a degree from, from a certain temperature. This incredibly co complicated, exquisite chemistry operating with enormous, I I subtle uh, feedback loop mechanisms and so on, we would need a chemical complex the size of New Zealand to duplicate that, that chemistry. And the thought that a bunch of dentists, dentists at the American Dental Association knew, knew more about the nature than nature about what a newborn baby needed for a healthy development was something which I found totally preposterous then. And 15 years later, I can see it's utterly preposterous now. And that's with, the, with the, all the evidence that we've gained from the last 15 years. So the, yet, yes, this is another example of man's extreme arrogance, the notion that nature is broken and we have to fix it. In this case, it seems rather insignificant. It's about tooth decay, and maybe we can improve tooth decay by improving on the level of fluoride in mother's milk. Now, let me say at the outset, I do not believe that fluoridation is the worst problem facing this planet. There are far worse problems. But the good news is, this is the easiest one to fix. All you need is a strong wrist. Just got to turn off a tap. You know, when the political will is there, it's as easy to end like that. I thought when walking to the, the village council that meeting, I said to my wife, I said, this is going to be easy, Ellen. This is going to be easy. I said, when they hear what I read this afternoon, there's no way they're going to continue to do this. It took us seven and a half years to get it out of our village. It ain't easy. It ain't easy. So to, to get that tap turned off, we need political will. We have to change. We have to get that political will. And the only way you can get that political will is by informing people, masses and masses of people. And that's become easier over the last 15 years because of the internet and because of the emails and so on. We can communicate better than we can ever communicate people to people, like-minded people to like-minded people, and they can't keep hidden anymore the evidence. The evidence, all the studies are almost instantly available for anybody to read. They can't hide it anymore. They can't keep honest people, honest scientists, doctors and dentists away from the literature. And they've done their best to do that. 
They've done their best to keep people away from the literature with two strategies. One, trust us, we're authority, we've got white coats on, we're your government, trust your government, and all these organizations endorse fluoridation, how can they all be wrong? Are they out to hurt you? No, 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 no. So you've got authority on the one hand, and you've got the other attack, which is the people opposed to fluoridation are Looney Tunes. And when you see the way they've gone after opponents, for instance, when Phyllis Mullinex published her pioneer study on the effect of fluoride on animal brain, she was sacked. She was fired. She was told that her work was no longer relevant to dentistry. So when people see what happens to opponents of fluoridation, it, it has a freezing effect. Most people don't like being ridiculed. They don't like being ridiculed in public. I did not look forward to being ridiculed in public, and it made me slow to react. Anyway, here we are, 15 years later. And I've, as I've just written a book on this. You talk about the 50 reasons, you should read that, but it's slightly dated. But this book is not, this was published in October. There's 80 pages of references here, 80 pages. And I said to my wife when I published this last October, I said, Ellen, it feels I've been constipated for 14 years and they've just let me have a crap. She said, don't say that, for goodness sake, don't say that. They think the book is a load of, no. Anyway, I've said it. That's the way. I, I, now, for me, this is 15 years of my life, and I'm so pleased I was still alive. <laughs> I was so pleased I'm still alive to see that published. And if I was to go tomorrow, at least this part of my life is, is um, on track. Okay. Let's go. But as I said to Lisa this morning with the awareness party, I said, whenever you're talking about toxicity, toxicity of substances, there are lots of toxic threats that we know about. Um, don't forget sustainability, the two issues. There are a lot of things that we can do which are safe, but they're bloody stupid because they're not sustainable. And I'm thinking particularly of incineration. There are all these engineers in Germany and Switzerland, Sweden and other places who are trying to devise the perfect incinerator. And when they've done that, uh, they will have won the booby prize. They will have successfully managed to destroy resources that we should be sharing with the future. So my other issue is the issue of zero waste for sustainability. And I hope, Lisa, that we, I can share some ideas on zero waste with you as well. That's the other part of my life. Now to fluoride. It'll be on the website. Okay, so this afternoon, as will this PowerPoint be. This PowerPoint will be on Lisa's website. So this afternoon, fluoridation is a poor medical practice. It's unethical. The evidence of any benefit is, is very weak. This was the big surprise for me because I assumed that the issue was going to revolve around safety and I was expecting the evidence that it actually worked to reduce tooth decay would be strong. But <laughs> incredibly, it's not strong at all. It's extremely weak. Uh, next, there's no adequate margin of safety to protect the brain from harm and other known health effects. And let's stress that at the beginning, there's no argument whatsoever that fluoride causes harm. It's damaged millions of people's lives in India, China, parts of Africa and Mexico where there are high natural levels of fluoride in the water. People's lives have been ruined. It damages their bones, it damages their brains, their endocrine system and so on. That's not an argument. That's not the argument. The argument is, uh, is there a sufficient gap between the doses which have caused harm in India, China, parts of Africa and Mexico, and the doses that we're likely to get in a fluoridated community, and is that gap sufficient to protect everyone? Not just the average person, but everyone, including the very young, the very old, the people with poor kidney function, and so on, and so on. And I will show to you emphatically that there is no ad adequate margin of safety. Next, why does the New Zealand Ministry of Health continue to push fluoridation? Uh, the $64,000 question. And lastly, the next steps. And the next steps, of course, is where you come in. I mean, this is useless. If you go away this afternoon and say, I heard this good talk by this guy from America, so I'm going to pull somebody, and he was very convincing. 
that fluoridation is a bad idea, but you can't remember any of the arguments. Uh, uh, it's useless. So hopefully, if this, if this is any good at all, it will be to arm you, to give you the ammunition so that you can win these arguments. You can win these arguments with your friends. You can win these arguments in public meetings and so on. And of course, as I said, this PowerPoint will be available to you, as will with the book. So it's a poor medical practice. In the 1930s, there was a short experiment where they added iodine to the drinking water to fight uh, goiter and other aspects of poor thyroid function. Didn't work because some people were getting too much iodine and they got hyper overactive thyroid glands, so they stopped that. Then they added fluoride to the water starting in 1945. And since then, they haven't used the public water supply to deliver any other medicine. None. And why is that? Because it's a clumsy tool to deliver medicine. Yes, you can get your engineers to control the fluoride concentration at the waterworks, but you don't control the dose, which is what hurts you. It's not concentration, it's dose. It, the dose depends upon how many liters of water that you drink. It's concentration times volume. It's milligrams per liter times number of liters. Now, I was in Australia a few weeks ago, and miners in Western Australia are drinking 10 to 12 liters of water a day. They're going to be wrecking their bones with that. In 30 years from now, these guys are going to be limping all over the place. So it's the dose you can't control. And ask any pharmacist, any pharmacist, is there any drug in your store that you can give to anybody and tell them you don't have to worry about the dose? Take as much as you want? No. He'd look at you as if you were stupid. Of course not. The second question is, um, it goes to everybody. When you put it in the water, it's going to go to the very young. It's going to go to babies that are bottle fed. It's going to go to people that are sick, people that have poor nutrition. It's going to go to everybody. Ask the pharmacist, is there any drug that you can give to anybody? No. Not at all. Is there any drug that you can put out there that the um, prescription drug that you don't have a doctor overseeing for side effects? No. Is there any drug out there that you are, that are prescribed that you don't have a health agency carefully monitoring the whole population for side effects? No. There have been practically no health studies uh, in fluoridated countries. Maybe a couple in New Zealand. None. They're just not looking. It's not a nutrient. Some, some proponents still talk about fluoride being a nutrient. There's not one single biochemical process in the body that needs fluoride. To demonstrate that something is an essential nutrient, you have to starve the animal of this substance. And if it's a nutrient, they develop a disease. You know, if you starve the old British uh, sailors of uh, vitamin C, they developed scurvy. That's why we called them limeys, remember? Limeys because they took the limes for vitamin C. But the way they found scurvy was they found that we, there was this nutrient that we weren't getting. They've never de demonstrated that any animal has got a deficiency for, vit for fluoride, yeah? They actually mixed the limes with the rum, otherwise they couldn't get the sailors to eat them. Oh, that's <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Very good. Okay. <laughs> So it's not a nutrient, but of course, as I've already mentioned, it is extremely toxic. Not only does it interfere with enzymes, but it also interferes with G proteins, which are uh, a little complicated, but basically G proteins are involved in getting messages across membranes. This is not something you want to interfere with. The chemicals used are not pharmaceutical grade. You know, dentists don't believe this when they're told this. They actually they are, this, these chemicals are obtained from the wet scrubbing system of the phosphate fertilizer industry. The wa a spray of water captures two toxic gases, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride, and left to themselves, those gases have decimated the local environment, damaged the vegetation, crippled cattle. And after about 100 years, you know, we're slow learners, they decided they had to capture those gases and the spray of water did the trick. The spray of water converts that stuff into hexafluorosilicic acid. Now here we get to something which is, there are many places where Monty Python could have written the script 
And I'm happy to tell you, if you think I'm a bit crazy, then blame it on John Cleese, because I was at college with John Cleese and played soccer with him, and that will sometimes show during this talk. You know, I can only remain serious for about five minutes, so I'll try. Anyway, this hazardous waste, this classification is it's hazardous waste, can't be dumped into the sea by international law. It can't be dumped locally because it's too concentrated, Get this, but if someone buys it from them, it's a product. And once it's a product, then it's no longer uh, has the cradle to grave uh, tracking regulations for hazardous waste. And the people that are buying this stuff from the phosphate fertilizer industry are the public waterworks, <coughs> public utilities. Now, we had a funny situation in Johnstown, New York, where they stopped fluoridating and they had a couple of barrels of this stuff left over. And they sent this memo around which is hilarious, it said, we have to find another community to use this stuff up within two months, otherwise it reverts to the hazardous waste classification and it's gonna cost us an arm and a leg to get rid of. Incredible. So here are these substances, the main chemicals used are silicon fluorides, the uh, hexafluorosilicic acid, that's the stuff that is captured in the scrubber, and you can convert that with sodium hydroxide into the sodium salt. If you use hexafluorosilicic acid, you can use that as a liquid, as a solution. If you want to use a solid, then you can use the sodium silica fluoride. Neither of these chemicals, either in their pure form or the contaminated solutions, have been put through any rigorous toxicological testing. All the toxic testing has been done on sodium fluoride, not on these things. And in fact, um, when they make this stuff, you've got a whole bunch of other nasty stuff in there as well. You've got arsenic, you've got cadmium, you've got lead, you've got mercury, all kinds of toxic metals in that stuff. And here is a classic case of the answer to pollution is dilution. Even though you've got all those nasty things in there, they think that if they dilute that 180,000 to 1 with the water, everything's okay. Except I should also tell you that the same phosphate rock that is mined for, uh, for phosphate, soluble phosphate in Florida, is also mined for uranium. And so there are also trace levels of radioactive isotopes in this stuff. Mind you, with the current situation in Japan, we might not make any difference. Um, now, the proponents claim that all they're doing is merely adjusting the levels of a naturally occurring element. Um, but because a substance occurs naturally does not make it safe. I've already told you that naturally occurring fluoride is wrecking the lives of millions of people in India and China. And also, arsenic is naturally occurring in some water supplies. It doesn't make it safe. But if you want a guide as to what is safe, uh, certainly what is safe for the baby, then nature's given you a very good guide. It's the level in mother's milk, and I've already mentioned this, the level is as low as 0 0.004 parts per million. Uh, the baby is getting 250 times that level in a fluoridated community. In New Zealand, your average levels are between 0.7 and 1. The average is 0.85, and so at 0.85, you're getting 200 times. 200 times the level in mother's milk. Again, that's 20,000% of the level in breast milk. The proponents claim that water fluoridation is not medication. But the definition of a medicine in most places, maybe not New Zealand, but in most places is a substance given to people to help prevent or combat a disease. And that's the, it's only the intention. Whether it does work or not is not the issue. If the intention is to combat or prevent a disease, it's a medicine. And fluoride is added to the water to help to combat uh, tooth decay. So fluoride is being used as a medicine and water fluoridation is mass medication. All the rest is semantics. That's the fact. It's a poor medical practice. The official classification in the United States from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is that fluoride is an unapproved drug. It's never been subjected to the randomized clinical trials of 
for any other um, drug on the market. Even though this is the most prescribed medicine in, in America, going to 180 million Americans every day, in every glass of water they drink, it's never been regulated by the FDA. However, get ready for Monty Python, it's coming in soon. Um, they are. The FDA does regulate fluoridated toothpaste, bless them. And here's a packet of fluoridated toothpaste or from the United States, Crest in this case, and on the back it says drug facts. So even Crest disagrees with the New Zealand Ministry of Health. Um, do not swallow. Only use a pea-sized amount, and that's a, a pea-sized amount. And here's the warning. This is the required warning from the FDA. Keep out of the reach of children under six years of age if more than used for brushing is accidentally swallowed, get medical help or contact a poison control center right away. Well, I'm sure you're all wondering what a pea-sized amount of fluoride, how much pea-sized amount of toothpaste at a thousand parts per million, how much fluoride is that? Answer, it's a quarter of a milligram, which is the equivalent of 250, a quarter liter of water at one part per million. So we're talking about one large glass of water. This is 250 milliliters right here. Now, Monty Python. Well, I think, John, I think, John, we should um, put the same warning in the, in the kitchen. Right then. Right then. Over the tap, do not swallow. Keep out of the reach of children under six years of age. If, if you should accidentally swallow a glass of water, contact a poison control center immediately. <laughs> now, I can't help feeling that the FDA scientists there were so pissed off that they've never been able to regulate water fluoridation that when they did this, they thought, this will end water fluoridation. When people join the dots, they will realize how ridiculous water fluoridation is. But if that was their plan, they failed because people can live with this discordance. They can live with the discordance here that says don't drink more than a glass of water, equivalent, and drinking umpteen glasses of water. Okay, it's not ethical. No government has the right to force medication on its people, especially to fight a non-contagious, non-life-threatening disease. I think some people, but not all people, but some people would possibly entertain the notion that if there was some terrible, catastrophic, contagious d disease, the government might step in and force everybody to have a jab of something, okay? You know, you'd have to override individual concerns here. But some people wouldn't even believe, accept that. But m many people would. But for a non-contagious, non-life-threatening disease to force it on people? No, this is lunacy. It's unacceptable. Um, it deprives the individuals of their right to informed consent to medication. Oh, this is just a philosophical difference, they say. It's a little philosophical difference. It just so happens that this little philosophical difference emerged from the Nuremberg Convention, where people were so disgusted with the human experiments by the Nazis during World War II, they said, never again. They said, you must not make human beings into experiments. You can't experiment on human beings without their informed consent. And this is the largest medical experiment that's ever been conducted on planet Earth by our governments. And we have not given our consent to this. And basically what's happening here is that a government is doing to everyone what a doctor can do to no one. If I as a doctor said to you, I've put some really good stuff in here, it is really great for you, really, really good, drink it and you said no i don't want to drink it drink it he, if he forced you to drink it and you said no he could lose his license because he's required to tell the patient what it's good for what the side effects are for and when he's gone through all that 
that rascally, irrational, emotional citizen still has the right to say, no, Doc, I don't want to take it. But our arrogant governments have said, no, we're going to force it on you, whether you like it or not. Now, the good news in New Zealand, this is still a local decision. You can still win this by voting against it. You can still win it by getting a council to vote it out. And that's happened, and it will continue to happen. In Australia, they're not that lucky. I've been into communities in Australia where they've had 800, 900 people to a meeting like this where we've had 23 local professional people in the doctors and dentists saying we don't want it and the de Department of Health in Victoria has said you are gonna have it whether you want it or not. I had the uh, dubious pleasure of an interview with the Chief Dental Health Officer of Victoria a few years ago and before I went there John I sent him a copy of the 50 reasons and when I got to the meeting and we started off I said have you had a chance to read the 50 reasons he said yes we have but it hasn't changed our opinion about water fluoridation I said fine I said would you be prepared to put into writing with all the scientific documentation your response to these 50 reasons and he looked at me straight in the face he said, neither I nor my staff have any intention of doing that. And meanwhile, they're paying a fortune to a public relations outfit to prepare a brochure, very flashy brochure, answers to frequently asked questions about fluoridation. So clearly, they can answer their own questions, but they can't answer my questions or other questions from opponents. The second question I asked him, I said, Dr. Hall, if fluoridation, if fluoride is so good for children, why is, it, why is the level of fluoride so low in mother's milk? And he said, well, mother nature has dealt some children a raw deal. <laughs> now think about it. Who are those children that nature has dealt a raw deal? These are the unfortunate children who are born in unfluoridated communities. How unreasonable of nature to do that. Incredible, incredible. Okay, the evidence is very weak that it works. Only eight countries in the world have more than 50% of their population drinking fluoridated water. Australia, Colombia, Ireland, Israel, Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, and the United States. You see, most of them are English speaking. Most of them are heavily influenced by America, or were heavily influenced by America or England or both. Japan doesn't fluoridate its water. China doesn't fluoridate its water. New, um, India, China, Japan, and most of Europe, 98% of Europe doesn't fluoridate its water. The vast majority of countries do not fluoridate. The vast majority of the world's population does not drink fluoridated water. In fact, nearly half of the people drinking fluoridated water live in North America. Now you understand a lot. <laughs> um, some of these European countries started but stopped. The Netherlands started and stopped. Switzerland started and stopped. Four of these countries uh, fluoridate their salt. But the vast majority neither fluoridate their water nor fluoridate their salt. Now, people, these government entities in Australia, when they're confronted with these arguments, it's amazing. They just say the first thing that comes off the top of their head. So when you bring up the fact that most of Europe is not fluoridated, they say, oh, well, that's because Europe doesn't have centralized water delivery systems. I go, what? <laughs> what? Germany doesn't have uh, France, uh, Scandinavia, Netherlands, they don't have centralized water delivery systems. This is crap. But it's straight off the top of their heads. Oh, well, it's because Europe has high natural levels. Oh, maybe one or two places, but certainly not all over Europe. And of course, they all fluoridate their salt. No, they don't. Only four fluoridate their salt. So it does disturb me that these civil servants are so ready to spin. You know, you, you, you accept the politicians are going to spin the moment they open their mouths. But you shouldn't expect that from civil servants, right? I, I thought that civil servants were meant to give uh, the decision makers objective information. That's what they're paid for. Hmm. Yes. 
Okay. Most countries don't fluoridate their water, but according to World Health Organization data, their children's teeth are just as good as those that do. This is World Health Organization data. We plotted it, but it's their data for 12-year-olds tooth decay from the 1960s to the present. And you see that tooth decay is coming down as fast in all these countries as the fluoridated countries. So there's four fluoridated countries here the yellow, orange, and brown, and the other countries are the non-fluoridated ones. And if you look down here, you see the tooth decay in all these countries for 12-year-olds. It's a wash. You can't tell the difference whether that kid's grown up in a fluoridated community or a non-fluoridated community. Okay? That's the big stuff. Okay. Comparing U.S. communities. This is the largest survey ever done in the United States. It cost the taxpayers about $4 million. They looked at the teeth of 39,000 children in 84 communities. And this is what they found. For children who'd always lived their lives in a non-Floridated community, this is about 8,000 kids, they had 3.4 decayed, missing, and filled surfaces. Now, in a child's mouth, when all the teeth have come out, there's 128 surfaces. There's five surfaces on a chewing tooth and four surfaces on a cutting tooth. They treat them like little cubes, okay? So 3.4 decayed, missing, and filled surfaces is less than one tooth, right? Now, over here, this is the average for 5 to 17-year-olds. Over here, it's 2.8 decayed, missing, and filled surfaces for children who'd lived all their lives in a fluoridated community, another 8,000 kids. Well, you can do a little bit of arithmetic, and you see there's a saving here of 0.6 of one two surface. Now, excuse me, Monty Python, you, are you listening to this? Monty, Monty... We are forcing this practice on about 400 million people worldwide. We are forcing it. We are depriving of them of their informed right to consent in order to force upon them a saving of, at best, 0.6 of a tooth surface. And that's before we get into whatever risk is in, involved. I'd like to have a gigantic statue of a tooth built outside the Ministry of Health or the uh, American uh, Dental Association in Chicago, and on it, 0.6 of one surface would be in platinum or something, or gold. And we'd all go down and worship the saving of 0.6 of a tooth surface, for which we've lost our fundamental human right to inform consent of medication, plus whatever risks we're taking. Anyway, anyway, in <laughs> you think that's... That's meager. It's even less in other countries. In, in Australia, the savings in two states, this was Western Australia, 0.12, and Queensland, 0.3. The difference, lifelong difference in tooth decay of the permanent surfaces. And this other study done in South Australia in 2004, no statistical difference in the permanent teeth, in tooth decay in the permanent teeth, between kids who drank fluoridated water all their lives or kids who drank a tank water. The important thing to note about all these studies that I'm citing, and I'll try to remember if one does not uh, fit in, but none of these studies are coming from anti-fluoridation scientists. These are all studies from pro-fluoridation dentists. Okay? This is their stuff. So they can't quibble with it because it's their information. Uh, Armfield and Spencers are adamantly promoters of, of uh, fluoridation. Uh, from Adelaide University, Colgate-sponsored. What about New Zealand? Well, you have a wonderful example in... in Auckland. Uh, Robert Mann is here. He is a colleague, uh, was a colleague of John Cahoon at Auckland University. And Bill Wilson over here was also a close friend and colleague of John Cahoon. One of my heroes. I met him in 1997 when I was here on Waste, fighting incineration in Mary Mary. And I interviewed him on videotape and I was really humbled by this interview, I felt, my God, if I'm ever in his situation, I hope I have the same guts as he's had of actually going in public and saying, I was wrong. You know, if somebody eventually shows that this is a bunch of, you know what, 
I hope I will go to the public and say, I'm sorry, I goofed, got it wrong. Would I have the courage to do that, or would I just keep quiet? I don't know. But anyway, John Cahoon, as the chief dental officer of Auckland, and then as a counsellor, was an avid promoter of fluoridation. He was so effective that he was sent on a world tour in 1980 to collect the evidence once and for all that fluoridation worked. He went to Asia, he went to Australia, he went to North America, he went to Europe. Four months. And to his utter dismay, the researchers behind the scenes were telling him, John, we simply are not finding a difference in tooth decay between the fluoridated and the non-fluoridated countries, communities. So he came back, a little crestfallen, to New Zealand, and he found a big report on his desk marked confidential. And this report was the tooth decay figures for the whole of New Zealand. In those days, every five-year-old and every 12-year-old had their tooth teeth examined as part of the National Health Service. And he looked at the data. There was no difference in tooth decay in the children in the fluoridated cities and the non-fluoridated cities in New Zealand. In fact, it was the, the teeth were actually a little bit better in the unfluoridated cities. He still didn't do anything public with this. And then his assistants came to him and showed him pictures of dental fluorosis. And at that point, he decided to act. He took the kids in front of the TV cameras and went to the public and said, I was wrong. He apologized and spent the rest of his life trying to stop fluoridation in New Zealand and beyond. A really courageous man. He had the kind of integrity. If everybody had his integrity, can you imagine what this world would be like if, if our government officials had that kind of integrity? Unfortunately, they don't. And what he discovered is the same thing that Robert Oppheimer's discovered. You have a very inflated notion of your power and your abilities when you are saying what the establishment wants. And when the establishment wanted an atomic bomb, Oppenheimer was a king. He was a god. But when he tried to, when he, after the bombs were exploded and he saw the damage he'd done, and he tried to reverse, he tried to stop them developing the hydrogen bomb and so on, he was just tossed over like a, a rolled up plastic bag. He was no longer of any relevance to the establishment. He was saying the wrong things and he had no power, no power. Worth remembering that. I call it the Oppenheimer factor. I, I found this myself when I was talking to groups around the world fighting incinerators. Oh, oh yes, oh yes, everything I was saying about dioxin. Oh yes, oh what a brilliant man. Oh, I wish I had you as a chemistry professor at college. And then when I've gone back to those same groups and tried to interest them in fluoride, oh, what a crazy guy. You're a pathetic little twerp. Fancy getting involved with fluoridation. What an idiot. You know. So you realize you, you get a very inflated notion. If you're telling people what, like now here, you want to hear that fluoridation is bad for you, right? So I'm the king for a day. <laughs> Wait for the next one. <laughs> Anyway, one of the things that um, John Cahoon did, after, after a while, he took a PhD. And I think, Robert, you were his, one of his advisors, yes, for his PhD. And one of the things that he found was that the Hastings-Napier trial for fluoridation, which was started in the late 50s, was a fraud. It was a fraud. The very study that was used to promote fluoridation all over New Zealand was a fraud. And it was a fraud for these reasons. One, they dropped the control city of Napier after a year because they were finding the tooth decay was better in the control city than in the fluoridated city. So they got rid of the control quickly. And then, then at the end, when they described the drop in tooth decay, they didn't tell people that they changed their way of classifying tooth decay. It was far less stringent at the end than at the beginning. So the drop, the so-called 60% drop in tooth decay was a reflection of an artifact of how they were measuring tooth decay at the end compared at the beginning. But they never made it clear in their reports that they changed that methodology. 
So that was fraud. That was fraud. But here's an interesting letter that was sent out in 1962 by the director of the Division of Dental Health. I take it this is Ministry of Health. I'll read it. You probably can't read this. This is in the middle of this experiment now. No one is more conscious than I am of the need for proof of the value of fluoridation in terms of reduced treatment. It is something which has been concerning us for a long time. It's only a matter of time before I will be asked questions and I must have an answer with meaning to a layman or I'm going to be embarrassed and so is everyone else connected with fluoridation. But it's, it's not easy to get. On the contrary, it is provided, proving extremely difficult. Mr. Espy is conferring with Mr. Bock and Mr. Ludwig, and I am hopeful in due course they will be able to make a practical suggestion. I will certainly not rest easily until a simple method has been divided, devised to prove the equation fluoridation equals less fillings. Now, if that's not a smoking gun, I don't know what is. You know, we're, we're seven odd years into the experiment, they're not finding the evidence, they're embarrassed by this, and they're struggling to find a way to prove that fluoridation equals less fillings. And now we know how they did it. They changed the methodology for the assessment of dental decay. I, I sent um, Dr. Calhoun's uh, study to the Associate Minister of Health, uh, Tony Ryle, and um, I said it would take a man of great patriotism and the ability to take a lot of flack in order to do something as important for New Zealanders as trying to remove fluoridation. So he passed it on to the Assistant Minister of Health. <laughs> Betty Lefifter, in 1998, described the difference in tooth decay in the permanent teeth, this was a survey of the whole of New Zealand, as clinically meaningless. Ah, but studies in the, from the Ministry of Health. I was, I was very fortunate to talk to the Ministry of Health last week. 25 people showed up. That was good. 25 people showed up. And I had before that read a report of theirs called Our Oral Health. And they found, this is quoting, they found that nine to 10 year olds continuously exposed to water fluoridation had half the dental caries experience. And this of course is the reason to keep this magnificent obsession going. Now they referred to four studies. Here they are. Lee and Dennison, 2004. They compared Wellington, which probably has the best tooth decay rates in, in New Zealand, the best, versus Canterbury. Wellington is fluoridated, Canterbury is not fluoridated, and they had a saving of one DMFS, 1.4 subtracted from 2.4, one decayed missing and filled surface. Okay, so that's slightly better than America. But what's the percentage difference? Percentage difference is only 41% saving. In actual fact, the percentages are very misleading. You look at the absolute savings, so one tooth decay saving. Um, but if Lee and Dennison had compared Canterbury with Waikato, which is fluoridated, or Otago that is fluoridated, um, they would have found that Canterbury was doing pretty well. It was doing 31% and 11% better than those two towns. So you have to be very, very careful when people are comparing two towns because unless you match up very carefully the income levels, you can get any result that you want. There's a far stronger relationship between income levels and tooth decay than you'll ever find with the absence or presence of fluoride in the water. Now, that's first study. Second study, K, I can't pronounce that name. Okay, no significant relationship was found between res residential fluoridation history and dental caries in the permanent dentition. Wait a moment, I thought the Ministry of Health was offering this as evidence that fluoridation was working. No difference, all right? Let's go look at another one, Schulter. Prevalence of dental to caries in the deciduous teeth, the first teeth, 54.9% in the fluoridated, 
62% in the non-fluoridated, a saving of 7%. Well, okay, that looks good. Not bad, 7%. Permanent teeth. Fluoridated, 15.9. Non-fluoridated, 11.7. Permanent teeth worse in the fluoridated areas, but not statistically significant. So this is another, no, either no difference or better for the non-fluoridated community. Not doing too well, right? There's three studies. Two have found no difference. One found 41% or one tooth surface. Third one, fourth study. They looked at the, the residents in a fluoridated community. Uh, if they had no residents, it was 1.22 DMFS. Continuous uh, residents, 0.7. The saving is 0.5 of a tooth surface, or 43%. So based upon those four studies, what have we got here? As far as saving permanent teeth, 0, 0, 0.53 and one permanent tooth surface out of about 1,000 permanent tooth surfaces in a child's mouth. And this is translated into half that children who lived in Florida communities up to 9 and 10 had a 50% reduction in tooth decay. Now, are these people that incompetent? Or well, that devious? Because I don't think the average person really knows what they're being told here. When they hear a, something like half the tooth decay, they're thinking of half a mouth of less tooth decay. They're not thinking of half a tooth surface. No. This is deception. Um, let's carry on. Now, to add insult to injury, there's some evidence that fluoride delays the eruption of the permanent teeth. And a one-year delay, a one-year delay would eliminate all the benefits that we've seen up to now. Uh, let me give an example. Oh, I, I should say this. According to the York Review that they're very interested in citing, no study up to 2000 uh, controlled for the number of erupted teeth per child. So no study actually controlled for the possibility that fluoride delayed the eruption of teeth. Now you could, I hope you can understand this. If there's fewer teeth in the mouth at the same age, say you're looking at eight-year-olds, if there's fewer teeth, then there's going to be less tooth decay because there's less surfaces to decay. So that's, that difference then is an artifact. So you've got to look at that. But they've... None of the studies up to 2000, and none of the studies I've cited yet from America, Australia, or New Zealand have actually allowed for this delayed eruption of the teeth. Now, if you do, this is going back to the American study, the big one, the $4 million study, the 0.6. Uh, if you uh, allow for one year delay, there is no difference no difference in tooth decay between the fluoridated and non-fluoridated communities. Just a one-year delay. Now, there's a little bit of evidence here. It's not complete. Apparently, according to this paper published in 2009, the dental age of children in Australia was found to be lower than the children in the UK by 0.82 of a year. In other words, you've got the chronological age of the children, and if you look at the number of teeth that are, where the teeth are at, the stages of development, the Australian children are 0.82 years behind the UK children. Now, they didn't offer an explanation of this, but one possibility is the fact that Australia is over 60% fluoridated and England is only 10% fluoridated. It's suggestive, it's not conclusive, it's suggestive. But here is something much more direct. Comorek, in a European study, did control. He did control for delayed eruption of the teeth, and he found no difference in tooth decay between fluoridated and non-fluoridated communities. And another recent and important study, this is another American-funded study, they measured tooth decay as a function of how much fluoride the children were swallowing. Not whether the kids lived in a fluoridated or non-fluoridated community where you're up against the vagaries of how much water they're drinking, whether they're drinking bottled water or whatnot. They actually estimated for each child how much fluoride they were ingesting per day. And they found 
No relation between tooth decay and the amount of fluoride ingested. So how do you explain this? We've either got very weak or we have non-existent evidence that fluoridation is doing anything for permanent teeth, the teeth that we have all our lives. Well, the answer came in 1999 when the Center for Disease Control, which is the big promoter of fluoridation in the United States, announced that the major benefits of fluoride are topical. Works on the outside of the teeth, not systemic. Oh my God. That was the point when fluoridation should have stopped right then. Because if fluoridation works on the outside of the tooth, Fluoridated toothpaste is right there, it's available. 96% of the sales of toothpaste in New Zealand, I believe, is fluoridated. So people are out there, they're getting this topical treatment. You treat it out, put it on the teeth and spit it out. This solves both the health problem and the ethical problem. Because with fluoridated toothpaste, you're not forcing it on people that don't want it. And secondly, you're not exposing every tissue in the body to a known toxic substance if you spit it out. Uh, even better, if you, do, if you just use toothpaste, but without fluoride in it, it's better. But that's another story. We can talk about xylitol and other things later. But basically what they're saying is we got the mechanism wrong for 50 years. For 50 years, pediatricians were giving fluoride tablets to pregnant women and drops to children and tablets to kids in non-fluoridated communities. The idea was that the fluoride would build up in the enamel of the teeth before they erupted, and then when they came into the mouth, they would be more resistant to acid attack. That was the theory. And then they said, whoops, no, sorry. Not enough fluoride accumulates in the enamel during development to protect the teeth when they erupt. This is Arvi Carlson, great person. He led the fight against fluoridation in Sweden in the 1970s and got the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2000. In 2000. He's a neuropharmacologist. He says, in pharmacology, if the effect is local, i.e. topical, it's awkward to use it in any other way than as a local treatment. I mean, this is obvious. You have the teeth there. They're available for you. Why drink the stuff? Well, of course, he's only a Nobel Prize winner. And so we should get John Cleese onto this, OK? John Cleese says, well, you know, you people in New Zealand, you people in New Zealand, you're so frightened of the sunshine, aren't you? You put all this stuff over your face, and you run around looking like Eskimos when you're playing cricket, right? We don't have to do that. You can just take that stuff and squirt it in your mouth, that suntan lotion. You squirt it in your mouth. You take it down, drink it up. Now, if someone suggested that to you, you'd say, wait a moment, um, this suntan lotion, isn't that meant to protect the skin from the... the, the Sunlight? Yes, yes it is. Well, how do you know if I swallow it that it's going to go through all through my body and come out and protect the skin? Um, and by the way, is it toxic? I mean, these are two questions you would ask John Cleese and he suggests to you this solution, right? But our Ministry of Health doesn't ask sensible questions like that. Okay, we've got to part four. There's no adequate margin of safety to protect everyone from known harmful effects. Now, I must tell you about this report because it's been largely ignored by New Zealand and Australia and all the other fluoridating countries, even though it's 507 pages, 1,100 references, and the most uh, comprehensive and thorough investigation of fluoride's toxicity in water that's ever been undertaken. And the other piece of important news is it was undertaken by an independent, truly balanced panel on this panel, they had three people that were opposed to fluoridation, three people that were very avidly for fluoridation, and six that had not taken a position. They thought it would take one year to review the literature. It took them three and a half years. I was the only scientist that was invited to present my arguments in person for 45 minutes, just after the Center of Disease Control, which was a wonderful experience. Because the CDC guy was the most boring public speaker that you've ever witnessed in your life. I mean, he was speaking, he was droning on. And his drone didn't even match the slides. 
He was out of sequence. And I looked and I was delighted because all these, I saw the um, panel members before I'm going, they're all reading my stuff before I'm speaking. And they're not listening to him at all. They're reading my, all right, never mind. Never mind. It was a, it was a walkover, but never mind. So they came out with this report and basically what they said, that their brief was to look at the safe drinking water standard in the United States, which is set atrociously high at four parts per million, and they came back and said, the standard is not safe, it needs to be lowered. The very same day that this report is released, the American Dental Association says, this is not relevant to water fluoridation. And six days later, Tweedledum caught up with Tweedledee and said, the CDC said, uh, this is not relevant to water fluoridation. This report is consistent with our promotion of fluoridation at one part per million. Now, first of all, it shows these people have no understanding of toxicology because they're assuming because they were talking about four parts per million, this wasn't relevant to one part per million. You can't do it by comparing concentrations. You've got to compare doses, right? Somebody drinking over four liters of water at one part per million would get more fluoride than somebody drinking one liter at four parts per million. So you can't do it on the basis of saying the concentrations we use are less than four parts per million. But that's what they did. That's what they did. Pathetic. And then the National Health and Medical Research Council in 2007 in Australia did exactly the same thing. They, they said they were doing a systematic, a thorough systematic review of the literature and dismissed this in one sentence. It wasn't relevant to Australia. This is the, you're getting a whiff, uh, a rather nasty stench of the politics that influences with this thing. Anyway, that report... Uh, listed, went through all the harmful effects of fluoride. And can I stress again, fluoride, not necessarily fluoridation, right? Remember that margin of safety we've got to discuss. So what they found is that fluoridation causes dental fluorosis. We knew that. Uh, fluoride causes brain damage. It lowers thyroid function, accumulates in the human pineal gland, it causes bone damage, Possibly osteosarcoma. Yes, we may even be killing a few young men. But what's the lives of a few young men if you're saving 0.6 of a tooth surface? <laughs> um, some people are very sensitive to low levels of fluoride, which is exactly what you would expect. Exactly what you would expect. If you were to subject a whole population to a toxic substance, you expect a normal distribution of response. You expect a few people at one tail to be amazingly resistant to that toxic substance. You'd expect most people to have an average response, and you'd expect a few people at this tail to be very sensitive to fluoride. So when you hear about 1% being sensitive to fluoride, that's exactly what you would expect. Especially when they report the same symptoms that other people get at much higher doses. Okay. Dental fluorosis. The early promoters of fluoridation thought they could limit dental fluorosis, I'll show you pictures in a moment, to 10% of the population in its very mild form. This is what it looks like. This is very mild. These are white, opaque patches up to 25% of the tooth surface. And that's at one range, and at the other range is little opaque patches on the cusp of the teeth, usually on the, on the corner of the teeth. You look around to your friends in Auckland and see how many people got these little white <laughs> opaque patches on the, on the edges there. That's very mild dental fluorosis. Now, mild dental fluorosis is up to 50% of the tooth surface. And moderate, notice the word moderate, affects 100% of the tooth surface with indentations and almost immediate discoloring. All of them can get discolored with time, but the moderate comes in and it's pretty discolored from the, from the beginning. And in November of last year, the Center of Disease Control dropped a bombshell on the United States when they told us that 41% of American children between 12 and 15 have dental fluorosis, and it's gone up by 9% since 87. So 28.5% have very mild, 8.6% have mild, and 36 either have moderate or severe. And they also pointed out that 
There was more dental fluorosis in black children, Afro-American and Hispanic children, than white children in the same communities. And it looks as if, that, uh, for whatever reasons, um, people with a dark skin are more sensitive to fluorides, certainly for dental fluorosis and maybe for toxicity in general. And here are some of the reasons for this. One is if you have dark skin, you, you produce less vitamin D, I'm told. Also, Afro-Americans are more likely to be lactose intolerant, so they're not getting calcium, which to a certain extent offsets fluoride's toxicity. And also, um, if, if the uh, communities of color are in low-income areas, that's also where you'd expect to find lower diets, poorer diets, and poorer diets, less protein, less magnesium, less calcium, less vitamins, would also make you more vulnerable for fluoride toxic effects. In New Zealand, the dental fluorosis rates are about 30%. Now, the key question to ask is what, when the fluoride is damaging the growing tooth cells by some biochemical mechanism, what's it doing to the other tissues in the body? And I'm concerned about the baby's brain being exposed to 250 times more than mother's milk, this is what Arvid Carlson said. He wondered what would happen if an increase of exposure through bottle-fed babies would have on the brain. He said that in 1978. Since then, uh, here's the, the National Research Council. It is apparent that fluorides have the ability to interfere with the functions of the brain. There have now been over 100 animal experiments showing that fluoride damages the brain. When the NRC looked at this, there were five studies which showed a lowering of IQ and now there's 24, there's 24. One was published just a few weeks ago. These studies mainly come from China, from Iran, India, and Mexico, that fairly moderate exposure to fluoride lowers IQ. This study from China is very important to me. I actually went to China at Zhang's invitation. I looked at the two villages where he did this study. Uh, for eyeballing it, the only difference appeared to be the level of fluoride in the water. They actually controlled for lead and iodine, which could interfere with IQ. And he found a drop of 5 to 10 IQ points across the whole age range. In fact, found a shift. The whole IQ curve was shifted over. This is for males. The black line is the low fluoride. The purple line is the high fluoride. So a whole shift in the IQ curve. Fewer very bright kids, more mentally uh, handicapped kids. Similarly with the females, the whole curve is shifted over. And he estimated that the lowering would occur, the threshold was 1.9 parts per million. This next slide is the most important slide. If you could remember this, it would be great. I'm now going to show you what I mean by margin of safety analysis. There is no adequate margin of safety to protect all of New Zealand's children from this effect. Um, Zhang found that the, um, the threshold was 1.9 parts per million. But don't forget, this was a small study group of a homogeneous, I mean, they're all Chinese, they all have similar everything in these villages except fluoride. Now you've got to extrapolate to protect all the children in New Zealand Different ethnic groups, different nutritional status, different everything, all over New Zealand, completely different. And what we normally do in a situation where you found a harmful effect in a small study group and you're extrapolating to protect, to find a level that protects everyone, you divide by 10. That's called the intra within, intra species variation. You're saying we expect some children to be 10 times more sensitive than others to any toxic effect. So, the first thing we have to do is to convert this concentration to a dose. So, I'm going to assume that these children were drinking just one litre of water a day. And I've done a sensitivity analysis on this, and it really doesn't make a huge difference whether you assume they were drinking half a litre or two litres a day. So, keep the arithmetic simple. One litre. So, those kids were getting... 1.9 milligrams per day of fluoride and lowered their IQ. That would mean to protect the intelligence of all the children in a large population, they could only drink 0.9 milligrams per day. 0.19 milligrams per day. That's 1.9 milligrams divided by 10. So to protect all kids, not the average kid, but all kids, 
It's less than a glass of water. Less than a glass of water. And that's why fluoridation should be ended tomorrow. You may be lowering the IQ of your population. Not by a huge amount, but even a little amount may not be of great significance for one individual, but it's that shift in the whole population which is the issue. You know, when we had lead in gasoline in the United States, we think we shifted the IQ down for all our kids by five IQ points. The average went from 100 to 95, not a big deal. But if you did that in the whole population, you would halve the number of geniuses in your society and double the number of mentally handicapped. That's why it's serious when you see a whole shift like this. Anyway, um, the, the first thing that they would do is to try to destroy Zhang's methodology. That's typical. They don't reproduce the study, they just challenge the methodology. They're going to have a hard job this time because Zhang resubmitted that study with some modifications, updates, to the environmental health perspectives. This is one of the leading environmental health journals in the United States. It's published by the National Institute of uh, uh, environmental health studies which is part of our Department of Health and they accepted it and they, they peer-reviewed it and accepted it for publication uh, we distributed a pr published online copy and then to a, our dis dismay it was withdrawn uh, Zhang had to withdraw this because some of the material had been published before now some, some journals will let you do that. They'll say, okay, yeah, you had some of this before, but you've updated it, it's okay. And he had updated it, but he had to withdraw it. But the, the thing to note here is it wasn't withdrawn because the methodology was weak. The methodology was peer-reviewed and published, was pre prepared to publish by America's leading environmental health journal. So they can't destroy the methodology. And meanwhile, about a week after that was withdrawn, another study came out from China, which looked at even lower levels between 0.3 and 3 parts per million conclusions. Overall, our study suggests that low levels of fluoride exposure in drinking water had negative effects on children's intelligence. And they found a relationship between the fluoride levels in the urine, which is closer to individual exposure, the level in the urine is close to the level that you are exposed to, it's related, and lowered IQ scores, and they actually plotted IQ, and the IQ is coming down as the level of fluoride in the excreted urine, meaning the exposure to fluoride, goes up. And that was, the p-value for that relationship was 0 0.0001, meaning it's very statistically significant, and the end result is, um, an increase in the fluoride concentration by one part per million is associated with a decrease of 0.59 IQ points. Again, not huge, but significant because we're talking about something being done to everyone. So we're left with two preposterous notions. What parent in their right mind would put their children's teeth above their brains? And what government would support a program aimed at lowering tooth decay by at most 0.6 of one tooth surface if it lowered the IQ of the population by even a small amount. It's interesting, 0.6 of a tooth decay and 0.59 IQ points for, okay. And the answer is, of course, New Zealand would be prepared to do that. Just quickly, osteosarcoma. Um, you can see the science and the politics here. Uh, Bassin, who's a dentist, got her doctoral thesis in Harvard and she found that young boys exposed to fluoridated water in their 6th, 7th or 8th years, this corresponds to the mid-childhood growth spurt when the bones are turning over rapidly. And a 5 to 7 fold increased risk of developing osteosarcoma by the age of 20. Osteosarcoma is a bone cancer which is frequently fatal for young, for young men. So this is where I say we might be killing some young men with this practice. Not many because it's a fairly rare cancer. Now the politics. Her boss, Chester Douglas, who is a consultant for Colgate, a promoter of fluoridation, 
just somehow for the next four years failed to tell anybody that his graduate student had found this, including going to the British Floridation Society one year later in 2002 and saying to the British Floridation Society, my work shows no relationship between fluoridation and osteosarcoma. Oh, they were so he pleased to hear that. But he didn't tell them about his graduate student's work. Totally unethical, totally unethical. I mean, he could have told them and given his reservations, but not to tell them, unacceptable. Her, she eventually published her study with uh, three co-authors. In the same issue of the journal, up pops Douglas again and puts in a, news, uh, a letter discounting, um, discounting her findings. He says, my larger study will not show the same results as Bassin. Um, and promoters of fluoridation have been using this promise of a study which is unpeer-reviewed and unpublished to knock out a well-conducted study which found that effect. And that includes the new, new uh, National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia. And Douglas promised his study for the summer of 2006 and we are still waiting for Chester Goddo Douglas to produce this study. That's the politics of the thing. Um, thyroid function, several lines of information indicate that fluoride exposure has an effect on thyroid function. And if thyroid, fluoride lowers thyroid function, it would explain the, de the delayed eruption of teeth, uh, the lowered IQ in children, and also the fact that we have a huge increase in hypothyroidism in the United States. Um, the pineal gland. Jennifer Luke showed in England that fluoride accumulates in the human pineal gland, which makes an important hormone called melatonin, which is like a biological clock. It, it's, it deals with the onset of puberty, jet lag, sleep patterns, and aging. And in animal studies, she found that uh, animals exposed to fluoride lowered their melatonin production and shortened the time to puberty. When she looked around in the literature, she found one study, only one study that dealt with anything to do with puberty and fluoride, and it was the second trial in the United States from 45 to 55, Newburgh Kingston, and she found that the young girls in the fluoridated community were menstruating on average five months earlier than the non-fluoridated community, which they didn't think was significant at the time. And that same study found a significant difference in cortical bone defects in the fluoridated kids, twice as many. The cortical bone is the outside layer of the bone, which is most important for protect against fractures. Uh, again, not felt to be important, but this study in Mexico showed that for children, as the severity of dental fluorosis goes up, meaning the exposure to fluoride before the permanent teeth come out, the, the incidence of bone fractures increased in a fairly linear fashion for both children and adults. Again, the promoters just content themselves with criticizing the methodology. There's been no attempt to re reproduce this study in fluoridated communities. Similarly with arthritis, we know that the first symptoms of fluoride's damage to the bone in India and China, just like arthritis, pains in the joints, stiffness of joints, and so on. And we have one in three American adults with arthritis. You ask a doctor, Doc, I got arthritis, what causes that? And he says, we don't really know. We think it's got something to do with aging. <laughs> well, it could be something to do with aging in a fluoridated community, whether you live 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years drinking fluoridated water. No one is looking in any fluoridated country. And we're also concerned about bone fractures. They, the NRC conceded that bone fractures was an issue with fluoride. Fluoride hardens the bones, but makes them more brittle. And whether or not that will have an influence on hip fractures is something I don't have time to go into, but there's one important study. If you go to chapter 17 in our book, we go into that in some detail. Now, as far as New Zealand is concerned, I should warn you that tea drinkers may have a problem here. The fluoride levels in tea, particularly in England, you know, you go to England, then first thing in the morning, they knock on your door. You're sound asleep, and this perfect stranger comes in. No, would you like a nice cup of tea, dear? So you have a cup of tea before you're awake, 
then you have two or three at breakfast, then you have elevensies, then you have lunch, and then you have tea time, of course, and it goes on all day. They have hundreds of cups. Well, here are the levels of various different kinds of tea, and if you assume that one litre is eight cups of tea or four mugs, somebody drinking eight cups of tea could be getting anything from one to uh, seven milligrams a day, if you drink 16 cups of tea, you could be up to 14.6. This person here is going to be getting levels of fluoride which are associated with the tripling of hip fracture rates in China. So a heavy tree, drink, tree, tea drinker could damage their bones. Now, um, and also don't give, ki don't give tea to kids too soon because of their brains, okay? But um, it may be, we may be lucky, it may be because the tea drinkers in Australia, New Zealand and England have milk in their tea and it's possible that the calcium in the milk is partially protect protective. You could hope, you can swing on it. But what I recommend is that you mix. <laughs> Don't just drink tea. Drink tea, drink herbal tea, drink coffee, drink water, mix it around. Don't have all, just all tea, okay? And also... This argument is another argument why you don't want to fluoridate countries like New Zealand and Australia and England because you're already getting a lot of fluoride from the tea. But I have some questions. Can we leave the questions to the end because I want to finish. I'm nearly finished. I'm nearly finished. Okay. Um, okay. This is the thing which I find shocking. And this is the, the subtitle here, How Hazardous Waste it Was Added to Our Drinking Water and the Bad Science and powerful politics which keep it there. So the bad science is coming up. It's atrocious. No fluoridated country has investigated, have done their own studies to investigate a relationship between fluoridation, lowered IQ in children. In actual fact, there's one small study in New Zealand, but that's it. Um, behavioral changes in children, arthritic symptoms in adults, hypothyroidism, Increased bone fractures in children, melatonin levels in children, early onset of puberty, Alzheimer's disease, and haven't tried to put on a scientific level these reports of people being sensitive to fluoride. This is atrocious. This is irresponsible. I mean, it's a violation of basic, you know, common sense, uh, medicine. Doctors are not trained to even recognize these symptoms. They're not trained at, at medical school. And talk about censorship, John. People have been trying to get me to give, um, asking the, the professors and the deans of Otago University for me to go in there and give this talk. And the dean of the medical school and the dean of the dental school are refusing point blank to allow me to come in to give a talk. When students independently asked me to come in, the dean called the students in, and now that's been quashed. And the motto for this university is dare to be wise. So Otago University, dare to be wise. But it gives you some indication of how little information that doctors are getting on this issue, at least in Otago. Maybe they're getting more in Auckland. I don't know. No. If you don't look, you don't find. The absence of studies does not mean the absence of harm. Monty Python, are you ready? Are you ready? Here we go. Dr. Peter Cooney, the chief dental officer, oh, wait a minute, chief dental officer of the whole of Canada, told an audience in Dryden, Ontario, and I was there, I heard it, I challenged him to a debate, but he wouldn't debate me, but he gave his talk. We videotaped it, so I have this delicious quote on video. He said, he's, he's Irish extraction, so I tried to give the accent. He says, I says, I walked down your high street today, and I didn't see anyone growing horns, and you've been floridated for 40 years. Now I have visions of the Health Canada's department. They have all these horn specialists. They have the whole horn department. They have specialists in cow horn, bull horn, goat horn, deer horn, even moose horn. And these diligent scientists comb the whole of Canada looking to see if there are any horns growing in anybody's head. And they, they've done this diligently for years and, and they, they've found no horns. So fluoridation is safe. Absolutely safe. Absolutely safe. Nothing to worry about at all. 
Okay, so why? Why, 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 why? The $64,000 question. I do not think, I'm sorry, John, I do not think they're trying to dumb down the, the world's population. I do not think they're limiting the world's, trying to limit the world's population. No, you don't think so. I, <laughs> you, you think so, I don't think so. But anyway, but the only rational explanation that I can come up with, which is only halfway there, is that the continue, these health agencies continue to promote water fluoridation even though the science indicates that it's neither effective nor safe is because it's, for whatever reasons, it's become more important to protect this practice than to protect the people. Now, of course, that begs the real question, why is that? And I'm trying to look at this rationally, okay, so why does the dental lobby continue to promote fluoridation? Well, they're very proud of this practice. If you argue this with the dentist, they're going to get very emotional about it. They're very proud of what they've done. Fluoridation helped to establish dentistry in, uh, on a par with medicine. You know, the, the fluoridation research took place in, in the 40s. The first trials began in 45. The US Public Health Service endorsed it in 1950, but in 1948, they built the National Institute for Dental Research in Washington, Bethesda, Maryland. So this is when dentistry became on a par with the rest of medicine in terms of getting the big money for research. All of a sudden, they're on the map. And fluoridation is the backbone of public health dentistry. So don't think they're going to take this lightly. They've built their reputations, their, their, their identity around fluoridation. Dr. Hardy Lineback in, in Canada confirms that dentists today are getting more money treating dental fluorosis than they are treating dental decay. So they haven't lost money with this. And they've certainly made their careers and reputations. Actually, I'm less interested in why the dentists keep doing this as to why the health bureaucracies continue to promote fluoridation. And before we can answer that, we've got to think at these bureaucracies at three levels. At the bottom, in the middle, and at the top. Or the top of the chain of command. When you think of the Ministry of Health, you've got the Ministry of Health in Wellington, right? And they are feeding their policies to district health boards which in turn are feeding them to local health boards and eventually right at the bottom you have the doctors. Now as far as the bottom is concerned, you've got thousands of doctors and dentists who believe in fluoridation. I believe in fluoridation is the best thing in the world that's ever been made because that was all I was taught in dental school or medical school. That's all my professors taught me was that this was a holy experience, this fluoride, God's gift to teeth. Um, anyway, but the trouble is, you see, that now that they've left dental school and medical school, they don't have time to read the literature. The three authors of this book, we're all retired. Retired chemistry, physics, and, and biology professors. So we had all the time in the world to study the literature. They don't have that time. And I don't hold that against them. The only thing I hold against them is without reading the literature, they're prepared to go to the public and say this is safe. And they shouldn't do that unless they've read the literature. They're just secondhand. They're passing on secondhand opinions as if it was their own. So they put that white coat on and say, I'm your doctor, I tell you it's safe. Okay, in the middle of the chain of command, what do we know about that? Bureaucrats are trained to promote, not to question policy. And if you're a bureaucrat and you're seen to challenge policy, you bye-bye, yeah. You don't make much progress in that. You're seen as a troublemaker, as you know, awkward. That Smith is awkward. Keep your mouth shut, Smith. Okay, so that's the middle of the bureaucracy. So we're left with the top of the bureaucracy. At the top of the chain of command of these health agencies, their major concern is credibility credibility and this is my equation this is my equation lose fluoridation lose credibility lose credibility and you lose or threaten the public's trust in other important public health policies 
And you can guess what some of those policies are. You see, when you get to that, when you get to that, you look at the difference between this almighty battle for 0.6 of a tooth service. Give me a break. The Ministry of Health has just given $1.2 million to an outfit to promote fluoridation. Is this all for 0.6 of a tooth service? Could be. I don't think so. But when you get to some of those other health policies, then you're into multi-billion dollar interests. And something which they would... You, see. you know, one of the interesting things about human behavior is all of us was sometime rationalize bad things with good reasons. We find a good reason for doing the bad thing, which is often uncomfortable. It's un uncomfortable, but we make it comfortable for ourselves. We have that amazing ability to do it. Let me give you an example I dreamed up and see if this works for you. Okay, so I'm in my 50s, and I'm working for a drug company. And I've discovered that one of the drugs which is earning a huge amount of money for this company is actually causing this health effect in my experiment. Now, I take this to my boss, and my boss says, don't you dare, don't you dare let that out. This will cost the company billions, and, and you know, you're out if you do that. Now, that guy says, gosh, if this was me, acting as a freewheeling individual agent, I would tell that boss to go and stuff it. I'm not going to do it. But I'm not a free agent. I have a wife. I have three children. I have these children at university. Their, their futures all depend upon my keeping this job at twice the amount of money I could earn elsewhere at 50. So even though this is against my interests as an honest, decent person, I'm going to sacrifice that in the interests of my wife and children. Now, I only give that as an example of how you can rationalize doing something which is bad, but pretending to yourself you're really being quite a noble person going along with this thing. And I suspect that something is happening here, that they have decided that if they say that they made a mistake with fluoridation, it's going to affect other health policies, which they are convinced are saving lives, improving lives, doing all kinds of things, and those would be threatened. And that's why they must keep fluoridation going. And what I said to them, um, and of course public health policies really do depend upon the public's trust. The public's got to trust. My response... I argued to the Ministry of Health last week that coming clean and stopping their support for fluoridation and switching to, say, the promotion of topical treatments and better education for diet, uh, John Cahoon's PhD thesis makes that point that education is more important than fluoridation. Health agencies would improve their credibility and regain the public's trust. So in other words, by keeping fluoridation going, when more and more people realize that this is crackpot, the science is not there to support it, is only going to undermine more and more the public's trust in them, and it's going to make it far worse than them. So bite the bullet, come clean. And you know from individual cases where people have the courage to do that, they, they don't lose. Ultimately, they win because we, people respect them more from admitting they've made a mistake. Now, the science is on our side. If you go to FAN New Zealand's website, you'll find the scientific arguments. If you go to our website, you'll find the scientific arguments. You'll find the health database that my son put together. You will also find that you can access this report online from our site. You can search it electronically from our site. So you've got access to that. You've also got access to this professional, this video, it's only 28 minutes long, it's um, 15 scientists, three scientists who wrote this, uh, Arvi Carlson, Nobel Prize winner, two former EPA, US EPA scientists, Sir Ian Chalmers, and a few other distinguished, uh, Phyllis Mullinex, who did the first animal experiment with fluoride on the brain, myself, Vivian Howard, really good, important people, and that's important for you to share with people because those who think that the people opposed to fluoridation are, are twerps, idiots, flat earth society, when they look at this, there's no way.
I think you do better just to get people to look at this rather than argue. Don't argue with them. Just try to persuade them to look at this with an open mind and then have the argument afterwards. And on that tape also is not only this on the tape that you can buy, but also the 28-minute interview with Chris Bryson and also a 59-minute interview I had from the crew at Alex Jones' show there. And that's the best interview I've ever done. That's 58 minutes of it. So you've got a lot of ammunition there. You have more ammunition today and, of course, our book. So with this, you can, you can really... We wrote this so that citizens would no longer be put down by the white coats. Because you say to the white coat who tries to pull rank on you, I'm a doctor, I'm a professional, and you're only a citizen, you say, fine, have you read the book? Oh, you haven't? Oh, well, when you've read the book, then maybe we can have this discussion further. So this levels the playing field for you, at least until they've read it. Then you might be in trouble, but anyway, <laughs> you can try. Thank you.